Mm. Don't want to get the get feedback. Okay, I am short, <laughs> but I do like standing behind a podium. So um, hopefully you can hear me, and you're not going to be looking at me anyway. You'll be looking at the screen. So, um, but if you need me to step out for any reason, let me know. Okay. All right. So today's program is called Stitches in Time. Um, it is not a program about how to quilt. <laughs> it is about a quilt. Um, and if you saw it on the way in or you want to see it afterwards, we actually did bring the quilt in question um, out from the cookhouse where it usually lives. Um, and we have it on display here um, for you to take a look at. So every year for the last four years, there's been something called the Lake County History Symposium put on by the Dunn Museum. And every year they have a theme. And this past April, the theme was History Through Objects which is really an interesting challenge. So you go into a museum and you see an object. And there's maybe 100 words on a label. And that tells you something about the object. But that object probably has a bigger story behind it or represents a bigger story. And so that was the challenge for this year's history symposium, is to take an object in your collection and tell its story. So when they announced it, I really wasn't sure what we would do. There wasn't anything particular in the house that I thought, this is the piece we're going to do. And then last spring in 2017, um, a new volunteer came through docent orientation. Her name was Marge Molidor. And she saw the quilt on the bed and said, do you know all the names on the quilt? And we looked at each other and said, no, <laughs> we don't. And so a project was born. Um, Marge came in and photographed every square individually. And then we loaded those pictures up onto something called Dropbox, which is an online storage. And then Marge and another person, Susie DeRose, spent time from home looking at the pictures and typing in all the names into a spreadsheet as best they could. Um, and after that, I took a look at the spreadsheet and said, you know what, there are some major names from Libertyville on this quilt. And we're going to tell the history of Libertyville using this quilt as the jumping off point. Okay. So it may look like just a quilt, <laughs> but it's actually a window into Libertyville history. And every Square is a pane that tells a different story about a different family, an event, or a business that was in town in the late 1880s. So this is the quilt <laughs> in a, a, that we're going to talk about this evening. Um, first, just a little bit about the quilts in general of this type. So this is a signature quilt. And basically, a signature quilt is a quilt that has multiple signatures or names inked, stamped, embroidered, or otherwise inscribed. And signature quilts were often group projects, with each block being sewn by a different person or signed by a different person. The finished quilt might be given as a gift or kept by the quilting organizer as a reminder of friends and relatives. In this case, the quilt might be referred to as a friendship quilt or an album quilt or a presentation quilt if it was going to be presented to someone else. Signature quilts were generally red and white, but sometimes blue and white, and generally were embroidered, although some are inked. Uh, many examples are considered to be examples of something called red work, which is a style of decorative needlework that consists of uh, red thread on a white background, basically. Um, also during the 19th century, when this style first became popular, Artists could now obtain a red thread that was color fast, and so red thread was often used for quilting. Um, the color fast dye was often referred to as turkey red. It was thought to have originated in India, then spread through the Middle East where it obtained its popular name. And by the mid 19th century, both turkey red dyed thread and the dye itself were available in North America. <laughs> A common use of these quilts was as a fundraiser. So this is a square from our quilt. Fundraising quilts started in the 1830s to raise funds for social causes. They were prevalent in the temperance movement and anti-slavery movement. There was a spike in popularity in the mid-1840s, which faded in the 1850s, but then had a real revival in the 1880s and 1890s. And a fundraising quilt provided two ways to earn money. First, members of the community donated money most often a dime, to have their name embroidered on the quilt. And then the quilt was either auctioned or raffled off to make further funds. And fundraising quilts continued through the end of the 19th century and into the first quarter of the 20th century. The Liverpool Mundelein Historical Society has several signature quilts in its collection, including this fundraising quilt, which is not the one in the back, but looks very similar. 
Uh, this was made sometime between 1885 and 1890 for the Universalist Church. We also have a circa 1918 World War I Red Cross fundraiser quilt, which was made by the Gilmore Auxiliary of the American Red Cross. And a 1923 lilac sateen that was made by the Liverpool Women's Club. And of course, our 1889 quilt that we're going to talk about today. So the Union Church quilt uh, is seven feet by five feet. It has 86 squares of nine inches by nine inches and a larger central square embroidered with the Union Church and the dates 1867 to 1889. It would appear to be red work, and the color is still good this many years later. Um, so it could be turkey red, though we don't know for certain. Overall, there are about 680 signatures on the quilt, although some names appear more than once. But no two squares are quite the same. Some squares have one name, such as R.W. Stafford, the pickle king of Libertyville. <laughs> While other squares contain entire families, this one is from the Ellis family. You know, as we go through this presentation, you will notice a lot of street names. Um, signatures include liberal residents, but also people from nearby communities such as Ivanhoe in Chicago, or as far away as New York, Boston, and Oakland, California. And that's about the extent of my animation knowledge. In <laughs> I do it a couple more times, so. Uh, sometimes the amount donated was also embroidered. Uh, Byron Colby paid a dollar for this entire square. Whereas the Merrick, or Myricks, if anyone knows that family, Merrick? No, okay. Uh, square cost a dollar sixty, which you're not even seeing. Uh, probably ten cents per name, since there are sixteen names on the square. Some squares have more detailed needlework, and it makes you wonder whether the named person embroidered the square herself and added the details to show off her needlework skills. And some squares provide personal information about someone in the case of Auntie March, who passed away the year the quilt was made, and Martha French, who was age 97. And I checked, she was. <laughs> So not only can this quilt tell the history of Libertyville, but it's also a genealogy landmine, or gold mine, not a landmine. <laughs> Oops, wrong word. Um, especially because the 1890 census doesn't exist. This is 1889. So it actually really gives you a good sense of who was here about that time period in Libertyville, which you can't really find in other places. So it's not known for sure if there was an attempt to match a person's actual signature. However, as evidenced on this square, there is definitely a variation in the script of the names. So seen here, you can see the Ds on the two names here are very different. Uh, there are the Fs are as well. The Ms in Mary and in the Mick are also very different. And the fonts for the Wheelers are also very different. The signature on the A.B. or Ansel B. Cook Square is very close to his signature in the portrait and biographical album of Lake County. So if the signatures were not being matched, the differences at least suggest that multiple people were doing the stitching and using their own uh, stitching and fonts. So the central square of the quilt says 18 by 18 and features a representation of the Union Church. With dates sewn around the church, it has been thought that the quilt signified an anniversary of some type. But a 22-year anniversary is a little odd. <laughs> and as I conducted research for this presentation, I've come to think of the quilt may actually be a signal of the end of an era. So construction of the Union Church, oh, I know how to do that too, sorry, uh, <laughs> began in 1866 after the destruction of the Methodist Church by fire. The building was led by a stock company of 63 stockholders and cost about $6,500 which is about $100,000 today. It was designed by architect W.W. W. Boynton, who is also the architect of our town hall, which is now the American Legion, as well as the Chicago Water Tower and several other Chicago area buildings. It was completed in 1868 with a dedication held in late December of that year. And it sat on Church Street, where St. Lawrence Episcopal Church is located today. Over its lifetime, the church was used as a meeting place for Methodist, Presbyterian, Congregational, and Universal churches, 
There were questions earlier about what denomination was union. It was a union church, so it was a union of several denominations. Um, each church had a separate hour for meeting, but the Sunday school was common to all faiths. As the individual congregations became financially able, they built their own buildings and moved out of the Union Church. So sometime between 1881 and 1884, the Methodist Church erected a 25 by 42 frame chapel building on the land the current Methodist Church sits on, on the northwest corner of Church Street and Brainerd Avenue. The chapel was intended as a place for weekday meetings, but because of dissatisfaction in the use of the Union Church with other societies, it became a place of regular worship. The Methodist Church history recounts that in 1890-91, there were concerns about the condition of the chapel, and the congregation considered purchasing the Union Church, but instead decided to build a church on the northeast corner of Milwaukee Avenue and High Street, which is now School Street, so think of where the Starbucks is. That's the building on the left. Right? So there was more than St. Joseph's Church as a church on Milwaukee Avenue. <laughs> this was there first. Um, the church was dedicated in 1892, and the chapel was sold and moved to Church Street, where it actually serves as a private residence today. The Presbyterian Church began work on a new building on Orchard Street, which is now each Church Street, at about where it bends, if you're going east, about where it bends before you get to First uh, Avenue. Uh, they built that in 1880 and was consecrated in 1881, and that's the church on the right side, so that's the Presbyterian Church. So that left the Congregationalists and the Universalists, who had organized in 1885, as the remaining regular users of the Union Church. And the Universalists had only 25 members at the beginning and seemed to have petered out by the late 1890s. I had mentioned earlier that I thought the quilt signaled an end of an era. As we have seen, by the time the quilt was made in 1889, the two larger congregations had built their own buildings, and the remaining congregations were small. The quilt may have been made to raise funds for building repairs or general maintenance, or perhaps there was a question of the Union Church building's long-term survival. In any case, in the 1890s and early 1900s, the buildings used for church services was in decline. During that time, the church was host to programs and performances such as Our New England Relatives, uh, the program on the left, or advertisement on the left, uh, performed by the Union Dramatic Company for the benefit of the Liberville Union Church. Uh, I think this is from 1890. And on the right is a picture of the oratorio of Esther the Beautiful Queen put on by local residents in 1896. The space was also used for Decoration Day, an early Memorial Day, that's the document on the left. Um, as well as local school graduations. And there's a program from 1905, I believe, on the right, held in Union Church. In 1912, the St. Lawrence Episcopal Church, which had been founded in 1908 and had been renting the Union Church building since 1910, purchased the building. According to published accounts at the time, the church had been vacant for a period of several years before the Episcopals moved in. In January 1917, a fire destroyed the Union Church, now the Episcopal Church. Around 7 p.m. on January 5th, Dorothy Sayers discovered the fire on route to choir practice, and the first fire alarm was received. The volunteer fire department worked hard but could not keep up and turned their focus to dowsing neighboring houses to keep the fire from spreading. Shortly after 9 p.m., quote, the cross on the top of the steeple which stood over 110 feet from the ground, crashed earthward, according to local newspaper accounts. St. Lawrence Church members were able to save one set of vestments, a small organ, and altar furnishings, but the Union Church building was lost. So how does the history of Libertyville present itself through the Union Church quilt? Well, you can start at the very beginning. The land along the trail on the west side of the Des Plaines River was mostly open prairie. Right at the present site of Libertyville, there was a grove of oak trees running back to what is now Butler Lake. This is a plat map from 1840 that you're looking at. An Englishman named George Varden settled in this grove in 1835, just about where the Anselby Cookhouse is today. That same year, William Cooley, Alcona Tingley, and Tobias Weinkoop also made claims on the north side of present-day Libertyville. In June of 1836, a stagecoach line was established along the New Milwaukee Road, connecting Chicago to Milwaukee. The newly established road 
cut through the fledging community of Barden's Grove and help to secure its future as an established town. And here's the Libertyville origin story. <laughs> a month later, on July 4th, 1836, the early settlers of Varden's Grove erected a flagpole in a small clearing and dubbed the community Independence Grove. However, when the new town applied for a post office in 1837, it was found that another Independence Grove already existed in Illinois. And Archimedes Winecoop, which is my favorite liberal name, <laughs> nephew of Tobias, suggested the name Liberville, and the petition was granted. So Horace Butler was one of Liberville's earliest settlers. Now, he's not on the quilt, but his family is very well represented. Horace Butler came to Illinois from New Hampshire in 1837 after graduating from Dartmouth. He first moved to Chicago to study law before moving to Libertyville, where he was the first lawyer in town. He was very active in public affairs and served as Justice of the Peace. Uh, he also had business interests in the Libertyville sawmill and flour mill, and today's Butler Lake, which was on the west side of his property, bears his name. The Butler Square includes Horace's second wife, Mrs. H. Butler, Sarah Ann Morse Butler, who was an early school teacher in Libertyville, and actually the uh, National Honor Society at Highland School, their chapter is named after Sarah Morse Butler. Um, and also Sarah Hannah Butler, his daughter, and Josiah W. are also on the quilt. Josiah's family, as of 1889, all appear. His wife, Helen Lund Butler, his toddler daughter, Hazel, and son, Horace. Josiah Butler carried on the family farm and also served as a justice of the peace. He was elected mayor for the 1885-86 term, and he married Helen Lund on November 10, 1886, and they have five children. And if you've been to the cookhouse, you may recognize this dress. This is wedding dress is Helen Lund Butler's wedding dress. It's on display in our front parlor. So when Liberty was chosen as a seat of the newly formed Lake County in 1839, the town's name was changed to Burlington, but reverted back to Libertyville when the county seat moved to Little Fort, which is now Waukegan, two years later. Development in Libertyville from 1840 to 1880 was slow but steady. During these decades, Lake County remained essentially a county of rural farming communities, and Libertyville was no exception. Census data indicates that the estimated population of Libertyville grew from around 67 residents in 1840 to 221 in 1880. In his 1854 history of Lake County, Elijah Haynes states that the village contains at the present time two or three stores, a large commodious hotel, a steam flouring mill and sawmill, and above all, two fine churches. So before I go on, if anyone's wondering what this is a picture of, this is actually a bird's eye lithograph, 1873 of Liverpool. So here's Union Church. This is where the cookhouse is today. That's probably Dr. Foster's house, though, not the cookhouse we know today. The schoolhouse is here. And in just a moment, I'm going to introduce you to this big building here. Here's Lake Street. Cemetery is out in here. So this is it. We have a copy of this upstairs on, in the hallway in the cookhouse. So if you ever come in, you can get up close and personal and just kind of stare at it for a while. It's really fun. <laughs> Jenny, yes. Do you have any reason why the lake isn't shown there? I don't know how far back it is. Um, and if this is truly to scale, that would be my only guesses. Because yeah, I mean, the lake would be like kind of over here. But it, you know, if it's, I don't know that it's to scale. All right. That large commodious hotel was called the Grove House which opened in the 1840s and is seen here in a tintype in the 1860s. The three-story 19th century Liberville landmark boasts a space for up to 59 guests, a large dining room, and a third floor ballroom. The exact dates of all the ownership changes aren't clear, but there is evidence that Eli P. Penniman ran the hotel for a time starting in the 1850s. And on the quilt, we have his son, Luther G. Penniman, and his wife, Mrs. A. E. or Amy E. Penniman. W.C. Farmham is mentioned as proprietor in the newspaper accounts of a New Year's Eve party in 1868 and 1869. On an invitation to a social party for the evening of September 25th, 1873, the gentleman must have been doing something right since the hotel was mentioned in news items in the Chicago Tribune. 
So, I know. <laughs> February 19th, 1875. Wednesday night, a calico ball was held at the Grove House, Liveryville. And Thursday, the following slayers and dancers visited the same hotel for a supper and dance. February 28th of that same year, another slaying party sat down to a splendid oyster supper, gotten up in a style for which the Grove House is so noted. By the 1880 census, C.P. Fisher is listed as a hotel keeper, and his wife, Amelia Penniman Fisher, daughter of Eli Penniman, former Grove House manager, small town, <laughs> as a landlady. August 23, 1883, Liberal Times confirms the name change to the Fisher House. Mr. Fisher's name is not on the quilt, but his wife, Mrs. C.P. Fisher, is on there. His children, Crit, Gary, or Gary, and Zadie, I want to make sure my clicking is actually keeping up with my talk. Yes, excellent. <laughs> they um, are on the quilt in order to represent the family. So uh, just a little anecdote that I enjoy. Um, CP's mother and father also resided at the hotel. And CP's father, Abram, was a stagecoach driver. And local lore relates to the Grove slash Fisher House was a stagecoach stop on the Frank and Walker stagecoach line, and that horses were changed at the livery station at the hotel. And one story says, it was the practice of the stagecoach drivers to whip their teams into a run as they neared the hotel and pull up with a flourish. Uh, another story says, at times, the mud on Milwaukee Road was so deep, the stage couldn't go on, and passengers had to stay overnight in the hotel, which is very convenient. <laughs> so potential stagecoach shenanigans aside, um, long-time liberal residents remembered the Fisher House as the social center of town, and more than one recalled learning to roller skate in the ballroom. Uh, upon his death in 1910, C.P. Fisher was remembered as one of the Lake County's true and honored citizens. So the hotel changed names again in 1894 when the Spore family took over. And I should mention anything that you see in here, unless otherwise noted, is from our collection of the Historical Society. And then it finished out its tenure as the commercial hotel under the uh, owned by the Proctor brothers and run by George B. Mason. And you can see the, when the roller skating rink was going to be open was advertised in the paper. So we'll find out what ultimately happened to the hotel just a little bit later. So Liberal's growth during the Grove Fisher Spore Commercial Hotel's tenure <laughs> was slow but steady. But it would really be the crossing of the Plains River by the railroad that would lead to significant growth and usher in a boom for the town. The Chicago, the Chicago Milwaukee and St. Paul Railroad ran a line from Chicago to Milwaukee in 1872, but it was on the east side of the Des Plaines River in Liverpool Junction, which is now round out. So bad roads and a scarcity of bridges made it difficult to get farm goods to the railroad and onto larger markets. In October 1878, a meeting of prominent residents was held at the store of G.H. Skink and a committee of Colonel E.B. Messer, um, George Skink, and Dr. Sam Galloway met to discuss getting a railroad into Liberville. I just have to take a little side note to talk about Dr. Sam Galloway, because when he's described in the portrait and biographical album, I just have to read this to you. He had a thousand times administered chloroform without accident. Out of 200 smallpox cases, he saved all patients but six. He attended 2,000 obstetric cases very successfully, amputated 46 limbs, attended 900 cases of la grippe, which is a Spanish flu, and 3,000 cases of meningitis. OK. <laughs> All right. So the three of them went to talk to the railroad company, and a deal was struck. The railroad would equip the road and one, run one train a day, providing the people of Louisville would grade the road, build a bridge, and provide the land for the depot. So a company was incorporated and a board chosen. The company then went to work. Recalling the push for the railroad, a special edition of the 1883 Liberville Times stated, the difficulty of grading a railroad by the aid of money raised by subscriptions and volunteer work can only be comprehended by those that have experienced it. Claims had to be met, rights of way to be obtained, graders to be paid, losses to be fought, routes to be determined on, but despite reverses and discouragements, the board fought bravely on and overcame all obstacles and to, uh, to their unwearied exhortations, I'm sorry, exertions, Liverpool owes her railroad. Um, in addition to subscriptions, funds were raised to the holding of balls. 
And for one such ball in February of 1880, the printers donated their service, the ladies provided supper, and the band provided free entertainment at the hall, most likely the Fisher House. That single ball raised over $200, which is about $4,600 today. So, and according to the reports of the time, the winter of 1879-1880 was a pleasant one, which allowed the work to go forward and progress swiftly. I actually went to check that. I didn't know what pleasant <laughs> might mean. And I did actually find that the National Weather Service uh, for Chicago has a seasonal winter precipitation ranking that shows uh, that this particular winter had 8.91 inches of precipitation, um, which was the 11th highest amount between 1871 and 2016. However, although the precipitation may be high, I'm guessing it was mostly rain because the average temperature was 35.2 degrees, which was the warmest on record between 1871 and 2016. So I, that's probably pleasant, unless you don't like working in the rain. But, you know. um, by the time of that February ball, the grading was almost done, and it was expected that the Libertyville accommodation would run to the village in time to take people to the National Republican Convention in Chicago, which is scheduled for June 2nd. And they made it. On May 31st, 1880, the first train whistle sounded in Libertyville. And the first freight was a carload of reaper for George Skank, who was vice president of the company that brought the railroad to Libertyville, and a carload of salt for George Anderson's dry goods store. So as expected, the coming of the railroad to Libertyville ushered in a building boom. Two grain elevators, a hotel and livery stable, two lumber yards, and several store buildings, about 25 homes, were built just in the two years between 1880 and 1882. Um, the picture you're looking at here is a little bit later than that, but the train station is here. This is the Libertyville Lumber Company, and this is uh, First Avenue right here. This is approximately um, Cook Avenue dead ending into the railroad station. Between 1880 and 1890, the village uh, population doubled from 221 to 550. So encouraged by the increased development, local leaders petitioned Judge Francis, C. Clark, Francis E. Clark in Waukegan to hold a referendum on incorporation. And the referendum was held on April 13, 1882. A strong majority of Libertyville citizens voted to incorporate as a village. And the first officers were elected a month later. John Locke, a New Hampshire-born farmer, was elected as Libertyville's first mayor. And actually, seven of the first eight mayors of Libertyville have their names on this quilt. Mm -hmm. um, the hotel and livery stable that was mentioned in the earlier quote was the Kern Hotel, which was established in 1882 by Henry Kern. His son, Frank Kern's name appears on the quilt. Uh, Henry Kern was a Pennsylvania native who settled permanently in the area in 1856, and he was a Civil War vet who served in Company C, 96th Illinois Infantry. He served for nine months before being injured when loading a boat. Uh, the injury was serious enough to have him discharged. After his discharge, he bought land in McHenry, where he lived for two years before moving to Fremont Township and finally settling in Libertyville in 1881. In Libertyville, he built the hotel near the depot and named it appropriately enough the Kern Hotel. The famous and frequent guests at the Kern Hotel were Char Charles and Eliza Nestel, who were little people known as Commodore Foote and the Fairy Queen, in the same vein as Tom Thumb. They spent a portion of almost every summer at the Kern Hotel. Said Eliza of Libreville, I have been almost constantly traveling for 25 years and more, but never discovered such a charming village as Libreville, which I have visited many times. Um, they were such good friends that Commodore Foote even attended Henry Kern's funeral in 1918. Mr. Fletcher E. Clark and his wife took over the hotel in 1897. Uh, Mrs. Clark was known for her food, and Mr. Uh, Clark was uh, known as a genial host. The Kern Hotel operated under that name until at least 1905, and over the next two decades, the name changed at least twice, and by 1994, it was shown as a dwelling on the Sanborn Fire Insurance map. So many other members of the 1880s liberal business community are represented on the quilt as well. Uh, Frank Zeno Kimball, born in 1851, arrived in Lake County from Vermont in 1872. And he taught school before going into the drugstore business. After an 1880 fire destroyed his business and his residence, he had lived above the store. 
he partnered with Dr. Fremont C. Knight, a recent arrival from New York, to build a new building and enterprise. The building here, seen in the middle, um, this is, this is Milwaukee Avenue. This is the corner of um, Cook, what is Cook today. Uh, the building seen here sometime before 1895 was completed in 1882 at a cost of $8,000, about $180,000 today, and Kimmel and Knight's drugstore was open for business. In addition to the drugstore business, both Kimmel and Knight were involved in local government. When Liberty was incorporated, Dr. Knight was a trustee and F.C. Kimball was a village clerk. Um, Dr. Knight was also very busy in other ways. He maintained a medical practice and he served multiple terms as Lake County Coroner, president of the Lake County Draft Board during World War I, and he was the organizer of Lake County Tuberculosis Society and a trustee for Victory Memorial Hospital. It's not clear how long the two men were in business together, but by 1883, the name of the store had changed to F.C. Kimball and Company, and Dr. Knight's name was off of the, um, off the sign. At some point, the business passed to Frank B. Lovell, although whether it was before or after Kimball's death is not known. Mr. Lovell led the store until his death in 1910. It was in the back of Lovell's drugstore where Liverpool's telephone service was established in 1898. After Frank's passing, <clears throat> excuse me, his wife, Augusta Messer Lovell, who is, is on the quilt, continued the business in partnership with pharmacist James Swan. The store kept the Lovell name until the mid-1940s when pharma pharmacist L. J. Petronic bought the business and changed the name to Petronics, the name the drugstore still has today. Okay, I guess get the page. No, Isaac Heath, all right. Um, Isaac Heath arrived in Lake County from Vermont in 1853. He was a carpenter and a joiner and established his business in 1865. He built many of the downtown buildings, including was actually the Heath building. Um, this building was built in 1883. The building is still standing at 521 North Milwaukee Avenue, currently home, this is the right-hand side of it. Uh, this is where Allure Beauty is, next door to it is the tavern but the cornice has been removed. So if you go look at that building, you can't, you don't see the triangle and you don't see Heath or the date on the building. I don't know if it's covered up, <laughs> um, but you don't see it. <clears throat> but it was there at one time. It was also, if you can see in the far top, there's a Masonic symbol. This is also where the Masonic Lodge met um, at this time. All right, a lot of these liberal histories are very men heavy and this one's not really that different. Uh, but I did want to pull out a few female proprietors that were in business in the 1880s and prominent on the quilt as well. So both Mrs. H.S. Hurlbert and Mrs. F. Protein operated millinery shops practically next door to one another on Milwaukee Avenue. Um, this is uh, Milwaukee Avenue on the left and Church Street on the right, or on the bottom of the, the screen. Mrs. Hurlbert was born on a farm in 1852. She married Henry S. Hobart in 1871, and sometime after moving to Liverville, she and her husband bought the business and building from a Mr. and Mrs. M. H. C. V. Mrs. Hobart was in business until 1908, when poor health forced her retirement. She would live until her mid-80s, passing in 1936. And Martha Ann Protein was born in Libertyville. She married Frances Protein at Tinsmith in 1874. And she operated her millinery business next door to her husband's hardware store and tin shop for around 30 years before selling the business to a Mrs. Lindroth in 1914. And in addition to running the business, Mrs. Protein was a member of the Liberville Women's Club, the Rebecca Lodge, the Royal Neighbors, and the Mystic Workers. She passed in 1925. Back to the guys. <laughs> um, Parkers and Diamond known as Dealers and Fancy Groceries, uh, was established in February 1882 by Edwin W. Parkhurst and Franklin P. Diamond. Here we have a picture of Mr. Parkhurst and his family about 1895. Um, Mr. Parkhurst was born in Vermont in 1844 and moved to Liverville at about age 11. In addition to his business concerns, all these people have lists of things that they did. Um, he was postmaster for eight years. He was township assessor. 
He was also a member of the Libertyville Wide Awakes. And if you come into the Cook House, you'll see a Wide Awake banner and Wide Awake torches. If you have questions about the Wide Awakes, I'm going to call out Sonia here in the front row. <laughs> She's our local Wide Awakes expert. Um, founder of the Lakeside Cemetery Association and the Liberal Universalist Church. Um, he was also on the board of directors that brought the railroad to, to town. Um, his fine home was built in 1891 and is now the Burnett Dane Funeral Home. F.P. or Franklin P. Diamond uh, was born in 1852 in Jefferson, Illinois. His family settled in Libertyville in 1864 along what is now known as Diamond Road. <laughs> he, this is interactive. Um, he completed a course at the Bryant Stratton Business College in Chicago and then work, went to work for George Skake. Uh, Diamond was also active in public affairs and he served on the school board and was elected mayor in 1887. The dry goods store did very well. In their first year, they had about $30,000 in sales, which is about $700,000. Teen and Hartford Fire Insurance. And the two gentlemen, along with George Wright, went on to form the Baking House of Wright, Parkhurst, and Diamond in 1892, which was the first bank in the village. The bank occupied a brick building along uh, at 525 North Milwaukee Avenue before building on the northwest corner of Cook Avenue in 1894. This is the picnic basket. Uh, later, the bank became Lake County Bank and then Lake County National Bank, and another new building was constructed in 1923 just to, oops, wrong button, sorry about that, um, which the building looks very much like that today. Um, it is, the bank that's there is not a descendant of this bank, but there is still a bank residing in that building, Liberal Bank and Trust. I've always wanted to use this picture in a presentation, <laughs> and I finally got my chance. <laughs> um, this, this one is actually, I should say, I believe this is actually part of Jim Moran's personal collection. It's not in our collection, but um, Jim is very um, nice and lets us scan all his uh, postcards. Um, Franklin Diamond was also a member of the Syndicate, a real estate investment company with big plans to promote and develop Libertyville. In addition to Diamond, the Liberal Land Syndicate was comprised of W.T. Eaton and Matt Pinkerton of Chicago. I have no idea if he's related to the Pinkerton detectives. <laughs> I don't know. Um, and Liberal businessmen John Woolridge, C.F. and George Wright, and H.S. Hurlbert, and R.J. Proctor. Which one was Diamond in I don't know. I wish I did. I don't have, uh, I don't know if we've got a picture of Diamond. I'll have to check and see. Um, organized in 1892, the syndicate purchased 525 acres of land on the east side of Milwaukee Avenue with frontage on the railroad and the Des Plaines River. Part of the land was subdivided into lots of 50 by 150 feet intended for residential development. This subdivision, which included land set aside for a public park, which is now Sunrise Rotary Park, was known as C. Frank Wright Subdivision. Does anybody live in that subdivision? No? Okay. Uh, so we've got Milwaukee Avenue here, Park Avenue here. So all of this, the whole neighborhood over there that has some of the older houses in town um, is this subdivision. Okay. Another section of the land was set aside for manufacturing purposes. The group built two factory buildings apparently on speculation. The building shown here was one of them. The three-story building was built in 1894, purportedly from timbers from the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition. The Thomas Manufacturing Company was set to move in in 1897, but abandoned its plans after failing to obtain a government contract. In 1898, the Earl Ladder Company moved in, and we have one of their brochures in our collection. They moved from Michigan to Libertyville to occupy the building. The building later housed the Foles Macaroni <coughs> Company, uh, that building is still standing today. Oh, the, build, the Folds Company went out of business several years ago. Okay. George Gake has been mentioned multiple times already. Let's talk a little bit more about his family. He was born in 1837 near Libertyville and started a hardware and farm implements business in 1870. Um, his sons Gordon and Lewis took over the business in 1900 and ran it until the 1940s. Continued to operate his skank hardware on the corner of Milwaukee and Cook Avenue, 
until the early 1960s when it was bought by the owner of the local Ace Hardware. The Ace Hardware is still in business today, but is re relocated to Peterson Road. So Gordon Skank and his sister Laura and their mother Mary Kay Skank are all represented on the quilt. And here is their original hardware building, hardware store building on the corner of Milwaukee and what is now Cook looking to the east. The Skank family business was very successful, but it was what would happen at their store overnight on August 30th to 31st, 1895. That would prove to be a defining moment in Libreville history. In the hours between August 30th and August 31st, 1895, cigar maker Max LeBeau was awakened by the growl of his dog. His wife thought there might be a prowler, but instead, Max discovered huge flames leaping skyward across the street in the back of Skank's hardware store. Max called out, fire, fire, rousing many people from their sleep, and bucket brigades quickly formed because there was no fire department. The Lake County Independent reported, many ladies carried water and worked like horses, while a few men hung idly on the fence at a safe distance, <laughs> whose room was better than their company. We need not mention their names as they were marked and their lack of sympathy publicly noted. They will be remembered. <laughs> <laughs> Despite the best efforts of those people who were carrying buckets, <laughs> and primarily because of a lack of centrally uh, readily available water, there was not a public well at that point. Uh. Fighting the fire provide, proved a losing battle. The fire burnt over 20 frame buildings to the ground, starting just south of the ninth building on the south side of Sprague Street and ending at the Methodist Church, which we saw earlier, which was saved by dynamiting the structure just to the south. The specific, specific cause was not determined, but there was no mention of a cow kicking over a lantern. <laughs> In the morning, there were just heaps of burning, smoldering debris. This is looking west, kind of along Cook <coughs> Avenue, uh, where Cook, or Sprague Avenue at the time. You can see at that point, Cook Avenue did not go all the way through um, to Butler Lake. Buildings on the west side of Milwaukee went mostly untouched, although some did suffer window damage from the explosion and the heat. The commercial hotel was destroyed, along with many other buildings that had stood since the 1840s. So this is the remains of the commercial hotel right here, and the Methodist Church is still standing. Uh, but Liberal was not sunk. And in fact, it was the start of a new era of growth. In a 1903 newspaper article, it said, Liberville's remarkable growth within the last few years is mainly the result of the Great Fire of 1895, which wiped out the entire business section. Since then, the grit and energy of its businessmen have materialized into what might be termed a united effort to build a new and ideal city on the ashes of the old town. So the 1895 fire caused much destruction and loss but it also cleared the way for building the downtown Libreville recognized today. Commercial development within the village of Libreville expanded rapidly at the beginning of the 20th century. From 1900 to 1910, 11 buildings were constructed within the central business district, nine along Milwaukee Avenue and two on Cook Avenue. The most important commercial block erected during this first decade was the Proctor Block, financed by brothers Robert, Charles, and Richard Proctor and their cousin Elijah. Designed by Chicago architect William Creek, the two-story brick building housed commercial storefronts and the New Castle Hotel, the largest of three operating hotels in Libertyville at the time. When it was completed in 1903, the block was lauded as Libertyville's first metropolitan building, the pride of all citizens. Towns five times the size of Libertyville cannot boast of buildings similar to the Proctor Block, and it can be said that such a building as the Proctor Block is just the kind of building Libertyville requires. Liberal had certainly entered the 20th century with a bang. So as this house is the home of the Historical Society, I can't leave out pointing out that Anselby Cook is on the quilt. <laughs> um, when the, when the uh, quilt was made, Mr. Cook had recently retired to his country home in Libertyville after a long and successful career in the masonry business in Chicago, as well as being active in Chicago and state politics. Mr. Cook's signature is on the quilt as well as the entire family of his daughter, Ida, and son-in-law, Dr. Albert Strong. Yeah. Um, this square, actually, this is off, off script, but this square actually makes me sad because I think, one, two, three, all six of their children are on this quilt, but only three of them will survive to adulthood. So 
I know, sorry, it was a downer. <laughs> um, there's also a square in the quilt that's representing the Barrows family of New Hampshire, the family of Mr. Cook's second wife, Annie Barrows Cook, and also his third wife, Emily Barrows. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the first one died, and then he married the second one. There was nothing else about <laughs> um, In the spirit of the wishes of her husband, Cook's widow, Emily Barrows Cook, left the house and gardens, seen here when it was a family residence, circa 1890, to the village of Liverville after her death in December 1919. And the Cook Memorial Library opened in 1921 after fundraising, fundraising and a few architectural changes intended to make the house look more like a civic building. It served as the library from 1921 until 1968, when the building you're in now was built. So during this presentation, I've highlighted just a small portion of the names on the quilt. Remember, there's 680 uh, names on the quilt. Um, these are people who were the center of Liverpool life, commerce, and significant events in the late 19th century. But there are other names scattered on the quilt whose impact was yet to be felt um, when the quilt was made. One of them, who was only 11 years old at the time the quilt was made, and actually 11 years old in this picture as well, would be the first woman to vote in Illinois. Her name was Clara Colby. That's a whole other presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them would serve their country in World War I. This is just one of the four level boys who served in World War I, and all, um, none of them were killed. And others would have street names after them. So in the upper left-hand corner, we have Austin. To the right, we have the Bulkleys, which Buckley is a um, mashup of that name. Mm -hmm. um, and we also have the Appleys in that lower square. Uh, but I think perhaps the most lasting legacy of the names on the quilt is found in the generations of families that have continued to call Libertyville home. This is one of the, the squares on the Brown family quilt. And this is the Brown family. And if you want to meet them, they're in the back row. <laughs> so I thank you for your, uh, uh, your attention and attendance, um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Yes? When you showed the, the brand new business section, yeah. Uh, in Libertyville, had a nice, a beautiful, wide sidewalk in front of it. <laughs> it. From here, it looked like it was cement, but was it wood? Well, that's a later picture, the one with the Proctor block in it. Mm -hmm. So that's from at least 1913, 14, because the building next to it, which now houses the Starbucks, mm -hmm. was built in, the, in that year. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, at that point, I believe that they are cement. It's <laughs> a much later picture. Mm -hmm. okay. I don't know. There probably were wood sidewalks at one point, but I think the ones in the picture are probably cement. And when did they start the fire department? <laughs> yeah, it wasn't immediately after. Um, I mean, there was, we have a whole book. I should, I should tell you, I should point you to the book, because off the top of my head, I don't remember the whole story. There was a call afterward, a fire. Um, I can tell you for sure there were ordinances passed after that. The buildings had to be built of brick. Um, and there were calls at that point for the fire department. I can't remember how long it took until there was one. But we do have a book that was written by, and I can't, uh, Jack Swan? Jack Swan. Jack Swan. Yeah, yeah OK. Um, that is in our collection, which you can check out should you want to learn more about the fire department. Okay. It's very detailed. It's a good read. Yeah, it's a good read, too. Yes, sir? Uh, where on Diamond Road did Mr. Diamond live? I don't remember off the top of my head, but I can find it on the map for you. Um, if you want to see me afterward, we'll go back to the 1885 Atlas and we'll kind of figure out where it was. Okay. <laughs> Right. Well, there's another. Yes, sir. Um, yeah. Jimmy, thank you again for helping us do the research on our house oh, sure. for the hundredth anniversary. Uh, and we found out that the, the Butterfield family built our house or had it built, and they didn't show up here, so they must have come in maybe in the twenties. You know what? They might be on there. It's on there. Yeah. So it's if you look, I do have a key to the quilt up here. Um, which is by square up here. So um, if you want to take a look, I did not pull them out for this presentation, but they may be on the quilt if, they, if you guys saw them. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for coming. If you want to take a look at the quilt, we'll have it here for you know, a while. <laughs> You're welcome.